Uh, Robert Blight, Rod Birdsall, Gary Hoffman, and Steve Kosar to come up and sit at the table. Okay, we are now ready to start with our uh, quality panel discussion. And I want to, first of all, I made up all the questions, but I did send them to all of the participants except Ed, and he got his copy yesterday. So. So I guess the very first question, maybe the easiest question, oh, I guess I should introduce everybody. Beginning on my right, your left, Gary Hoffman, Steve Kozer with PennDOT, Robert Blight with New Jersey, Rod Birdsall with All States, and Ed Maris with Massachusetts. Okay, so the very first question, how do you define a quality preservation treatment? I thought that would be a, a, an easy question to answer after wrapping up two months of QC training and quality assurance training at MassDOT, but you know, there's, it's not necessarily that easy a question for preservation treatments that are not hot mix, and that's kind of what I've been focusing on for the past couple months. But I think it does come back to some of the same basic concepts, and what was the first thing we were taught? about HMA. Smooth, dense, and uniform, right? Well, to me, that's a lot of what we're still looking for. I mean, we are looking for a product that can reliably provide the desired service life, but, you know, smooth, it's got to provide a good ride quality. Dense, it depends on how you define it, but I think on a lot of these, these treatments, we need, you know, proper compaction, proper finish. And then uniform, I mean, to me, Quality is, is uniformity, having a product that is consistent, having a product that is uh, where the materials are a high quality and a consistently high quality, and workmanship that's a consistently high quality. I'll, I'll sound maybe like a little bit of a broken record, but I think it's the point that we have to keep driving home uh, the, the right treatments on the right roads at the right time. Um, that philosophy for this group is probably ingrained in your heads. So that's probably not an issue, but transferring that up through your management and others in your design units, your uh, materials units, your construction inspection area, um, I think is an important point. Uh, Ed said about the ride quality has to be good uh, from any pavement preservation treatment, actually any treatment, but um, it also has to have a, a friction level that's acceptable as well. Um, and, and looking or thinking of the customer, it has to be quick to do or as quick as possible to do so you minimize delays to the customer as well as uh, the time out there to do the treatments and when you heard about those thin lays I mean they only have 10 minutes to roll uh, and compact the material that that's one treatment that uh, hopefully is a very quick uh, thing and they they did I know the Cameron Street at night so they were able to get on and do that project very quickly Communication of what treatments are available, I think, is something that's our all responsibility to transfer uh, to the design community, the materials group, the inspection group. Uh, and with employee turnover, I know in our agency, I mentioned it uh, either yesterday or the day before, we constantly have to keep training people on the same topics. So you can't just think you did it one time and you're done. You got to keep, keep at it, just like you got to keep preserving your roads. You got to keep uh, educating your staff and uh, employees, both construction uh, uh, folks on the contractor side and the department side. Uh, training and education, you got to keep that workforce well trained. They need to know how to evaluate properly the distresses and make that determination what is the proper treatment. Okay, the next question, what do you see as the greatest risk to quality in preservation treatments? So, Ron? Actually, uh, I, I think it comes from two, two sides. The first one from an industry side, a lot of you have heard me say I think there's only two things to make a business, and that's uh, good customer relationships and having great employees. And from, from a contracting point of view today, I think workmanship, if we look at the program yesterday and some of the data that was shown um, you know, with workmanship and, and, the, and how that plays in the overall quality is extremely important. And if we look today, in my opinion, uh, materials issues are very small from a contractor point of view. Most of it is, is training. And I think now as we move forward, the training and certification 
uh, becomes very, very important as far as, uh, you know, how do we uh, improve or reduce the risk, let's say, of, of, of issues. From an agency point of view, I th my, my opinion is it comes back to the right treatment on the right road at the right time and really understanding uh, from a pavement management point of view, what is the right treatment depending on what's available from not only the, <clears throat> the availability of a contractor, but of materials, what's the conditions? You know, is it a, a high volume road, low volume road, or whatever? And, and really understanding the best practices. I think that that's the, the, the really the key and, and really what the risks are is, is the training and certification are ultimately the real goal of improving where we're at. What he said, for sure. <laughs> um, but what I see in our own department is sometimes complacency. We've been doing these things a while, and uh, we think, yeah, this is, we've, we've done this before, no problem. Then we hit a stumbling block and things go bad. Um, you can't become complacent. Training, as Steve said, has to be, you know, emphasized all the time. And, and I think, from my perspective, it should be done on almost every job. Not almost, should be done on every job. At the beginning of the job, everybody should know what's expected, what the treatment is, what's expected, how to achieve quality, how are we going to do it, and go over it. We have prepaid meetings um, on some of the special treatments. We'll have a, a separate training in addition to the prepaid meeting. Um, I think I'm seeing it more and more that when things go wrong, it's because people became complacent because we've done this before and then things go wrong because there, there are people, as we all know, this is an aging industry and there's turnover and there's new people that get involved um, and things happen. You know, maybe do, not everyone has that level of understanding that they need to. Quality is something that you got to stay vigilant and stay active all the time trying to achieve it. Great answers. I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative and add one more risk that I see, and that is agency pulling funds on, on, progr on programmed work when the delay in, in a preservation project of a year or two years it can really turn the tide between a good treatment on a, the right road to a treatment that is now a Band-Aid treatment, and that gives our performance expectations a real hit when that happens. And I've seen it happen way too often. So, um, so I'm adding one more, one more risk in there. Next question, are we using the right treatments on the right roads? That was asked as a yes or no question. Gut reaction is, I would say, I, I hope so. I mean, we've been doing this for a while, but you know, we're never too old to learn. We tend to use what we're familiar with. And for us, it's, you know, ultra thin bondeds and, you know, thin overlays. I think trying new things has some risk, but I think there's rewards too. I think we do have to take opportunities that arise to expand our horizons and, and, and use new treatments, keep our eyes open to other experiences, and, and really come to these type of events to, to learn what other people are doing. Right treatment, right road, I'm going to go back to right time. Looking back at the work that we've done, I'd say maybe a quarter of the projects I could have waited a year or two, but, you know, is your timing ever perfect? I'd say half the projects, I was happy with the timing. And then a quarter of the projects, I'd say, you know, they got out there a little too late. And part of it was, was our delay in advertising. So to me, right time is, is the, the challenge. How do you time these to be, to work out? You know, winters like this past winter, it wasn't that, a, that bad. But the number of free thaw cycles we had did a number on a lot of our, on a lot of our infrastructure. So to me, the, the right, treatment right road, I'm happier with the timing, I, I can use improvement. Like Judy said, Ed uh, is pinch hitting. He really didn't have much time to prepare. We didn't compare notes. The first thing I had for the answer to Judy's question was mostly yes. We're selecting the right treatments. Um, so I took it as a yes, no kind of answer too. Um, but I said sometimes no though, and that could be due to various issues like budgetary constraints, you know it's not going to perform the way it was supposed to, but that's the only choice you had at the time that could be coming into play. 
Uh, so hopefully those are the minimum uh, types of situations. Coupled with the constant turnover is there's constantly changing specifications as well. So we're hopefully improving them. So that's another reason why, hey, we've maybe been, did, maybe been doing this treatment for a long time, but something has just changed or been tweaked. We have to continue to make sure we're doing the best application with the best uh, training and education at the time. Um, so new treatments could be not new as well. They could be new to your state or your organization, but others have proven them. And like with uh, Mass.Ed's Mass case, we had people go up there before we knew anything about asphalt, rubber, and gap graded situations, and we learned from them. So uh, I personally didn't do it, but others from our department did uh, at the time. So uh, learning from each other at events like this I think it's very educational, and this is the community for pavement preservation in our area. Uh, so new doesn't always mean new, but it could be new to everyone, too. And the, uh, there's no availability, first of all, of a contractor and or the materials, so sometimes you have to go to your second best, and that might not be what you really wanted to do, and you're stuck with just what you have in your planning books, you only got A, B, or C, you don't have D. And sometimes that could create a problem for you. I don't know, that's just from my end what I see. The next question is, what can be done, what should we be doing to improve our specifications in pavement preservation? Robert started down the line here with his, uh, with his uh, training, an excellent uh, comment there, but you said with our, with our aging uh, workforce, I thought you were going to say it's easier for the folks to forget, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad you didn't go there. But it is, that is a true statement, by the way. But uh, just-in-time training, and let me let me point out that uh, John Becker and and I are involved with the first composite design pavement um, in Pennsylvania, which is going to be constructed uh, this construction season. And a requirement in the contract was was to do just-in-time training for long-life concrete, long-life asphalt paving mm -hmm. techniques, which, which require that within a certain period of start paving, that there's a, and I think we're on the hook to train 40 people from both the, the, the contractor side and from the DOT side on all these techniques. Get people together, collaborate, here's the expectations, blah, 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 and I think that's, that's an excellent thing to do. Let me tell you that I think one of the best things that we can do with, this, with a specification is to go to performance specifications with an incentive disincentive clause. And from experience I had over the years, uh, I think an, an ID clause in a contract is a better way to get to Best Buy in a low bid environment. And what I mean there is if you think about it, um, if you're looking, uh, you're putting a, an incentive out there, and those contractors that have a, a, a pretty strong probability of getting some or all of that bonus will bid some or all of that bonus in their, in their bid to get the bid. And I've seen that over and over again with, our, with when we initiated the ride quality uh, incentive disincentive, when we in initiated our longitudinal joint incentive disincentive. It makes dramatic improvements over time because folks are they're f they're focused on um, making a profit and getting the job. So I, I'm a strong believer um, in that. Where I said before, we're fortunate in Pennsylvania that we have good collaboration among the DOT, the industry, and FHWA, and I think that's important when you're putting specifications together, especially um, and performance specifications, where you're hoping that those specifications you're putting out is not only indicative of short-term performance, but long-term performance. Uh, and then uh, that's a plus. And while we're talking about best practices, uh, you know, we can all go out and look over, over the United States and look at what are the best practices and maybe get some uniformity among the states on those best practices. And I know that's a tough thing to do. And, and you say, well, not in my state. We're unique here. Well, we're not all unique. We know there are some best practices that can be implemented across the board. Well, just uh, talk about, um, he's cheating off my notes here because I have just-in-time training, I have <laughs> move to performance-based specs, incentives and disincentives. We didn't, we didn't collaborate. <laughs> um, but there are a couple things I had here that uh, I think 
uh, I could add to the conversation here. Uh, monitoring and evaluating our performance uh, using pavement testing is, is one area we have to continue to do. Using non-destructive testing methods is another opportunity. Um, reviewing other manufacturers' specifications and new manufacturers' specifications are coming out. Um, I had here uh, what Robert had mentioned, I believe, earlier about pre-paved meetings, making sure everybody's on board. You have the pre-paved meeting, hopefully everybody's there. Um, you, you actually read the contract parts that are necessary, identify problem locations that uh, you know about or aware of. Because just because you've bid a contract doesn't mean you've actually read everything, and uh, even though that's a requirement. Gary asked me to, to move into, uh, or just mention again, that Pennsylvania is a, a war mixed state. We've done that primarily from a compaction aid standpoint, and we've seen increased densities. Our average density for our projects last year was 94.6%. So we've, we've increased every year through this uh, PWL initiative. We've actually increased on our asphalt content, uh, the standard deviation of that. We've increased on our 200 sieve and our primary control sieves, uh, depending on the, the mix. If it's a 9.5, 12.5, uh, it's the number 8 is controlling it, and the number 4 is controlling for the um, uh, 19, 25, and 37 and a half millimeter. Standard deviations have decreased. <laughs> so we've improved. We yeah, we've improved by having lower standard deviations. And our longitudinal joint densities have a uh, incentive disincentive clause as well. And we've gone from 87.8 uh, back in 2007 to 92.8 in, in 2017. I, right, I don't know. Right on the joint. And so we're about 2% below our mat density with our center line joints. So it's a big improvement. Hopefully we're going to reap the benefits of that with less uh, uh, joint deterioration in the future. Add to that to bring out that the department has gone to a percent within limit specification, which essentially is an incentive disincentive specification. It's a different way of analyzing the, the uh, data. It looks at standard deviation. And as Steve noted, uh, that, that's been in place for three years now. And we've seen a decrease in standard deviation each year on all our pay factors. What is industry doing to improve quality? I guess uh, I'll, I'll take a little different approach here. I think, I think when we look at what industry is doing or the business in general is if we look back, um, some of us in the room have been in business for a long time. And, and really, we're in an industry that's very, very slow to change. And what I mean by that is if we look at, for example, at emulsion testing, um, we basically test emulsions the same as we did 50 years ago uh, until some of the new things that are happening. And, and I think if we look at particularly at the hot mix thing, we changed our thinking a lot when, when Sharp was done and SuperPave came about. That it isn't business as usual. And I think that's really kind of changed things. So if you look today is, is what is industry doing to improve, what I would say is we're really looking and developing new binders, new designs. I mean, we're looking differently at performance tests that a few years ago we, ne we never even thought of. I really would give credit from, from the liquid or emulsion side more so than from the hot mix side is what Jim Sorensen brought to our industry. I mean, Jim challenged everybody and created the emulsion task force that has led to a lot of changes. I mean, we're looking now um, within that group of developing specs, as I mentioned yesterday, there's never been chip seal microsurfacing specifications in an ASTO book, which is hard to believe when you think about how long those processes have been around, especially chip seals. Um, so it's really coming from an industry point of view, and we've been very, very active uh, in working with ASTO and, and getting those things done through the ETF, and, and, and industry has been very supportive. I'd say the other thing um, that I would mention is the PPB PPRA group, uh, which is ISAEMA and ERA together, have really been leading in some of the training. Um, if you look at the ISA programs and what they've been going on for over 10 years with their annual training to certify 
their equipment operators and now bringing agencies in to even understand what the processes are. So I think that has really brought the quality up what they're doing. <laughs> and there's certainly today are a lot of webinars that are, that are being done. There's YouTube things and those kind of things um, that, are, that have really done, uh, worked toward, toward improving um, the quality um, in, in what, if what we're doing. Lastly, I'd really say that, that we, what we really need to focus, and, and there's been a lot of work done here in the last few years, and the National Center has been a big driver and that is in the looking at certifications and developing quality control plans and really understanding what the expectations are. We can't do good work, whether we're contractors or agencies, if we don't understand what our expectations are and how do we improve that to get better. Anyway, um, thanks, uh, Rod, for those good comments. With the experience, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate I've had experience on the owner side and now many years on the industry side, and, and you see with, with that experience, a, a, a diversity of focus that folks have on quality. Uh, you know, in the, in the DOT, there's, there's a different focus on quality from one district to another. In the same way in industry, you know, I could, I could rate, you know, we have 40 plus producers that have their own testing labs. And I, could, I can't list them number 42 through one or four, you know, but but you can rank them uh, from a from a quality focus, and it all no question it all starts from the top in a mindset that the leaders have, whether it's a CEO of the company, whether it's a district exec or the deputy secretary for highways and the DOT, that's where it starts. And how do you get how do you get all of those folks uh, to to demand good quality, and then always put their money where their their mouth is hire the right people, give them the best equipment, the best training, th to do the best job that they can. Uh, I don't know from an industry standpoint, uh, uh, Charlie in the back and I are, are out there promoting this all the time, but there, there are state uh, awards and national awards to hold these folks up in front of their peers and say, you know, they, they won this job or they want, you know, that job or whatever and hold them up for doing a good job. And we have one of our producers who who has won the one national NAPA award, um, the Sheldon B. Hayes Award, four times in the last 15 years. Unprecedented. Uh, so everybody, <laughs> the district say to us, how, how do we get all our contractors to be like this contract? Well, that'd be nice if we could. Um, and that's what we strive for. So uh, recognize the folks, uh, give, them, give them help. Um, give them uh, training. Rod said, uh, you know, webinars and and, uh, and and free training. Get out there, collect the best practices nationally, and then put together training formats uh, to do that. Is there a better way? I know we have the pre-qualification process for contractors in Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't think that we use that to the best of our ability. To give the advantage to the better contractors and the disadvantage to the not so good contractors. So there needs to be more teeth in that, a better way to get people to focus on, focus on quality where it hits them in the pocketbook. Do our inspectors know what they need to look for to ensure quality? Short answer, no. They're, a lot of these guys have been doing hot mix jobs for years and, uh, you know, or, or they're brand new, one or the other. Uh, they don't have a lot of experience with this, this the thin treatments. So they, there's definitely an opportunity for more training with our inspection staff. Uh, construction in New Jersey, it, our construction division reached out to me and said, hey, we want to have inspector training this year because we have a lot of new guys and they don't know what to look for, what to do. So we, we, I did that. Um, and then we also had a pavement preservation, a day of, of pavement preservation, just pavement preservation for an entire day. And I was exhausted at the end of that, let me tell you. Yes, absolutely, sometimes, maybe. <laughs> of all the UTBO jobs we've done, I have not had the same inspector twice. So, you know, we have high turnover rates night work with visibility issues, staffing levels, and to be honest with you, the older experienced guys aren't, they don't want to work nights, and 
to be honest with you. If you've got an ultra-thin project that's fairly short money versus, oh, a ComAv bridge replacement in Boston, you're probably not getting your most experienced, most knowledgeable inspectors. So there is room for, for improvements in training. And then, from my standpoint, if it's one of my projects and it's something that we haven't done before, you bet I'm going to be out there the first night. You bet I'm going to be out there on the control strip. You bet I'm going to go and drive that project within the first two days of when it's going down. Our inspectors need some help. They'll need some guidance with these new treatments. And I think we need to help them with the, with the training. All right. This is the one sentence per person answer. OK, Gary, one sentence per person. <laughs> Okay, if you could change one thing to improve quality, what would it be? I, I would really like to see an improvement in, in, in our training for preservation inspectors. Um, that, to me, that's, that's where we can make improvements. I'll make it a compound sentence, how's that? I, I would say uh, training and certification enforcement of development and requiring quality control plans and adherence to them. I agree with the first two guys. I mean, really, it comes down to the training and certification and doing it annually or whatever it takes to just to raise the bar, you know, and, and make it a point to do that. Well, we should have went the other direction on this question because I got the same thing Ed said, uh, the inspection staff, because we've had, there are studies out there that indicate you know, most of your issues are in the constructability or construction aspect. So that's the group that really needs to have the, the, the most up-to-date and the best training, uh, in my opinion, to get you the most bang for the buck. All parts of the, the system need to work, though, because any one of them can, can mess things up. If you don't identify the distresses properly, you don't pick the right treatment, you know, every part of it, the planning, do you got enough fun funding to do the right treatment? Um, so they all are important. But if you look at, you know, 50 or more percent of the issues are in construction, that's probably where you want to have your training. So that's a little bit more in a sentence. Okay, I might be considered heretical here from an industry side, but let's say modify the low bid environment. I'm sorry. <clears throat> hey, Mukesh, what, what would you say? How, mu how much of it is in uh, consultant inspectors and how much in-house inspectors are you seeing? So you need a clarification, consultant inspection with the, with, uh, uh, versus yeah, I think the question was how much of the work is inspected by consultants and how much is inspected by in-house forces, DOT forces. Yeah. So sometimes for, for, uh, for pre uh, payment preservation job point of view, uh, we need training. You know, training most important thing. So sometimes we are getting the inspector from the consultant. They don't have enough trainings for that that treatments, and generally uh, hepto, uh, chip seal, slurry seals, you know, and, and, and that training require, uh, because uh, this is a very uh, uh, temperature sensitive and workmanship relation point of view, which is very thin overlay, you know. So uh, we, we are getting late, uh, late training from the uh, consultant when we are getting. So when we are, we are EOI, we are particularly asking the consultant that uh, inspectors support show this type of training uh, for a particular construction point of view. And that's, uh, we are, at, uh, in uh, NJDOT, we are uh, experiencing some uh, lack of experience for from consultant side. So the answer is there's a, there's a split. You know, there's some consultant inspection. There's a, a lot of it inspected by our state forces. Um, we have issues with consultants not understanding what these things are because they're not really trained in it. They're typically just trained in HMA paving, you know, general construction inspection. From a from Massachusetts standpoint, our inspection is done all by DOT forces. Now, some of them are retirees that have come back, but they're typically some of the more highly trained, more experienced inspectors good question I, I really don't have the numbers in front of me to that, give you an accurate answer Gary and I quick talk to each other we were thinking more of a 50 I was thinking more of a 50 50 split and he was thinking more of a maybe two-thirds one-third two-thirds consultant uh, but we have both because we might have uh, consultant inspectors on the project for the day-to-day -day work but then we will have a, a department 
project manager who might have 20, 30 jobs that they're responsible for. So they'll stop in and visit when key operations are taking place, but they might not be there to see everything either. So I think both, both need to be trained. And like Ed said, we have uh, people who are retired are consultant inspectors too. So they might have been department employees previously. So I think we have that in the mix as well. And all, all our inspectors at different levels have to take a certification course and pass a test, like I'm sure in, in other states too. So that doesn't mean they're qualified across the board, but they do get some training and, and, and testing. Yeah, I don't think you're here, Gary, when I presented about the, the I mentioned our NSEP training uh, requirements. I want to thank you all for attending. Let's give our, our panelists a round of applause. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.